Chapter 10, Implementation, because our publishers wouldn't let us say impact. This is the chapter that is about putting the ideas, the theories, and the plans into motion. And it's about how you document going from, hang on a minute, I've got a great idea, to actually delivering, and then working out during the delivery how well you're approaching your metrics, how well you're measuring off those metrics, and how well you're succeeding. So there are different types of implementation that the chapter covers. And again, the chapter has a real focus around the idea of e-marketing as part of a bigger picture, that you are implementing something because you've got a bigger game plan. So this first issue is the idea of the cost-oriented implementation where what you're looking at here is you want to have the same sort of outcome but for less investment. This is where we address that dreaded question of marketing being a cost. Here we say for the, for investment of X dollar you get Y outcome where Y equals yield. The method, how we put the implementation together here is that we start documentation. We're looking at the timekeeping, we're looking at implementation records, we're looking at is it cheaper? Are we spending the same number of hours or less hours? Are we spending the same amount of dollar per hour? What are the metrics telling us about our success? The next question that you want to be answering when you're doing an implementation based around cost is is it actually saving money? There was a big mythos around early e-marketing of the idea that because Twitter and Facebook, they were free, therefore we didn't spend any money on marketing, except that it, they all required time, time requires staff. So you're looking at this again in terms of, are we saving money? Are uh, our online and offline costs have, do they have parity? Are we actually making a better return from our online investments? And are the customers at least breaking even, if not actually benefiting? If they're suffering and you're losing customers, you're not saving money. You're not cutting costs. You're increasing costs and losing money if you are shedding customers in a cost-oriented approach. So you want to be careful about that. So the first implementation approach is all about the metrics. You need to know what's happening, when it's happening, how long it's taking. Your second implementation approach is, again, metrics, metrics, metrics. Sell more. Sell. And this has got a really good ANSOF attachment to it. Basically, you're looking at sales. You're looking at using the internet as a sales platform which means you have a massive amount of experimental data. You have A-B testing, you have pre-test, post-test. You have everything at your disposal to map and measure, did my implementation, did tweeting something on a Friday lead to an increased sales figure by the following Friday? Was there week in to week out? Could we track changes in sales by where we posted our links, by the conversations we had? So we basically also have a whole series of metric detective work. Does a specific activity lead to a direct sale? Does the activity lead to an indirect sale? Can you pick up a detectable pattern? Can you see activity because your metrics in social media are very well defined? You can look back and go, did we increase our sales over time as we increased our customer satisfaction by increasing our interaction with the customer. Does the non-obvious, does the responding to an app message actually lead to sales because people see that the company, well, the company cares, therefore this is a good company to buy from. The other question you want to be looking at is basically path mapping from what you do with the internet and offline as well. If you run a radio ad, do you see a spike in traffic and does that traffic spike result in a sale? If you run an ad in a paper, do people come to the website and buy? Can you track your marketing activity to a sales outcome? 
The behavioral change, this is an interesting approach because again, it's metric experimentation. You're basically asking here, are people doing a specific task that you're asking of them? Are the people using the new system or they use the old system? Particularly, this is useful around the idea of bringing in an opt-in system. So what you need to do though on opt-in is opt-in by default. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr all have opt-out mechanisms, which basically are the cheater's way of annoying your customer and hitting an internal metric, which is people are using the new system. People don't like the new system, people are leaving, but they're using the new system because we forced them to. That's not a behavioral change goal, that's dumb business. So in behavioral change, you want, to, you want the new behavior to be better than the old behavior for the customer. So this brings relative advantage to the forefront. It brings a question of, are you actually cutting off other options? And if you are, are your competitors still offering those alternatives? And if they are, how badly are you bleeding people to other platforms, to other areas? So behavior change, there's a real, there's a sense it could be the easiest one to cheat, but cheating is just basically hurting the company in the short, medium, and long term. The information design, the information dissemination implementation approach, you want to communicate a message to the market. And in the community chapter, in the advertising chapter, there are a whole bunch of different ways of communicating with the marketplace. So your obvious method is, have you spoken? And your metrics around this can be, did we put out a message? Did we run ads? Did we get eyeballs? Do we get traffic to the site? How's our search engine optimization? If we are disseminating the answer to a question, we go to Google and we ask that question, does our site come up? So this is the question that you want to be having here, is how are you distributing the information and are you enabling other people to share it? If your objective is to get the information out there, so in a trailer for a movie, a release date, an advert, is it easy for people to share this content? Do they have to sign off on a set of electronic forms, click an I agree, here's my user's terms and conditions before they're allowed to even go and pass on your advertising? How is it set up? Is it shareable? If you want to disseminate information, you need to make it easy for people to share. Are there single click shares? Are there ways in which I can reblog retweet, regram, or otherwise share and transmit this information? How can I, as a fellow internet user, curate this content if information dissemination is your implementation goal? Promotion, you have two choices, persuasion and information. If it's information, you're really using the previous implementation. We're gonna talk here about promotion, Obviously, you've got the whole the promotional mix, you've got the whole advertising chapter. Viral for the sake of viral is a dumb branding decision. Controversy for the sake of viral is a worse decision, and your lawyer should justifiably take you out the back and shoot you. And I'm not talking metaphorically. If you decide that your plan is you'll do something racist, sexist, homophobic, thoroughly offensive to start a conversation, you're an idiot and you deserve the job loss that's coming your way. If you want people to talk about your product, it needs to be valuable and meaningful conversation. It needs to be beneficial conversation for the person sharing it and for you as an organization. So basically, will you get conversation for the right reason? If yes, go ahead. If it's gonna generate the wrong type of conversation, basically a lot of people saying, this brand sucks, Sometimes you're going to have critics who will attack you. And if they are not your audience, then what you need to do is hold the middle finger up to them and tell them to get stuffed and defend your audience. 
If you go in a bat for your audience and fight for your audience, you will draw a clear segmentation marker point. If you go out and say, no, you're not my customer, you're not my clientele, I don't want you, that audience won't be happy with you. But if they're not buying from you in the first instance, you shouldn't care. Now this does open it up to a whole, this is one of those ethical areas where it opens up a whole lot of consequences. But if you're willing to live with your consequences of an audience that will never buy from you, not liking you, then go for it. The other thing that you want to be questioning is basically in promotional implementation, if there's personal relationships, if there's PR, public relations, if there's blogger relationships or there's trying to communicate to influencers, are you doing it sensibly? Are you actually thinking about, is this person, do you know the person you're trying to persuade to promote your brand? Do you know anything about them? And are they a good match for your firm? Because if they're not, then all you'll happen is you'll get you'll generate conversation, but for all the wrong reasons. Entertainment, this is the ultimate, there's one metric for this, and that is, is the audience having fun? There are no other metrics. I don't care what I've got on screen, but it comes down to, if I'm, it is the gladiator question. Are you not entertained? And if you are not entertained, then this has gone wrong. There are means in which we can do this. But basically, it comes down to the measurement of, are people coming to the site? Are people sharing the content? Are people sharing, you know, if we have a game, are they sharing the high scores? If it's a social game that requires people to help their friends out on some form of Facebook-based uh, flash animation, okay, I'm old, it's HTML5 animation or Unity browser, is it really annoying? And are people basically starting to post, if you share one more candy card, Crush Saga life request, you're going to need a life support of your own. Are they, is it fun for the people who are watching? Is it fun for the people who are playing? And of course, the ultimate entertainment oriented question, and that is, what is the cat in the photo doing, and how do we caption it for hilarity? Big footnote, don't meme, basically, don't say it if you don't meme it and don't try to get the kids. This is one of the marketing things. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there where I have no clue how or why somebody's talking about something. It doesn't make sense to me. So I should not try to create content into that sphere because I don't know what I'm doing. The last thing on the entertainment oriented implementation you need to be considering is that if you are really successful, and you create a message that's got resonance with the audience. Your brand, your slogan, your catchphrase, you're gonna lose control of that catchphrase. But so long as people can attribute it back to you, that's all you're looking for. You don't need ownership of entertainment as much as you need entertainment to have a secondary purpose. So now you've got a bunch of implementation approaches. What it comes down to is the big ticket item measurement. Now way back at the start when we set out objectives, objectives lead to metrics. Metrics are a central point. But what you need to be able to do in a metric is you need to be able to measure both what you're doing and the consequence of what you're doing. Now the thing about measurement is that we automatically go to counting and we go and start thinking well if we can't measure it and report it and produce stats and bar charts and tables, is it really happening or is it worth happening? We can measure in other ways. We can talk about qualitative measures. We can use a whole series of our market research skills here. We also have to remember is if it's measured, it gets done. If it gets done, it probably should be measured but not everything's going to be immediately demonstra demonstrably measurable until you sit down and work out how you explain it. 
You also want to look back at what has been measured previously, what knowledge you already have, particularly what changes can you demonstrate. If you've just set up a social media account to support the operation of an ongoing business, how can you use the history of that business to demonstrate your impact, to demonstrate what's happening now? And measurement as well is a real creative challenge. If you don't forget to measure what you've done, not just what impact it had. So if you are going to bring back a report of an Instagram timeline, talk about the type of photo. Talk about the type of photo that had the most likes or the ones that had the most comments, but also talk about the type of content that was produced. What type of images did you use most? How did these images promote the brand? Explain. Measurement should always be about explanation. Sometimes you can explain by counting. Sometimes you've got to explain by describing. All right, this is the big one. This is one of the big issues in the whole of the internet, particularly consulting, music, art, take out food and startup restaurants. The money, it's okay to get paid and it is vital that you value your work. Your time is your currency. So being paid for work is good, it is acceptable, and this is what it's gotta be about. The business models are gonna be about the money. So, first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is when someone says, oh, how much is it? Particularly artists. Artists are terrible at this. Artists look at the canvas and go, oh, that was about 50 bucks worth of paint, 100 bucks worth of canvas, oh, 200? Which means that everything else, planning, training, time, overheads, studio hire, brushes, thinners, every other part of that's gotta be made out of that $50. Because they've only calculated cost. The other thing that you're going to want to do is you want to, you'll probably want to discard the preparation, planning, research, and the backgrounding and go, well, it doesn't really count, sort of. You also need to consider that if you, you still need to get paid, you still need to sell your services, but if you disregard your opportunity costs, if you're capable of getting $100 and you're only bidding out at 50 then you're missing these opportunities. You're missing that for every hour of work you get that you're under that you are budgeted below your break-even points and below your costs is going to be a cost. So basically if it's going to cost you 50 bucks an hour to operate and you sell yourself up for 40, every hour you buy is going to be bad news for you. Five hours in, you've already lost. So be careful about this. You're gonna to wanna to discount your own costs. You're gonna to wanna to ignore costs. And I worked for a private sector firm where we didn't factor in rent. When we were budgeting what it cost us to produce a particular product, we left out the office rent. Because it was just like that thing that we, it's not cost towards this project. Except of course we weren't making enough money per product to keep the lights on and pay the rent because our profit margin wasn't high enough to cover our costs. So effectively, we didn't have a profit margin, we had a loss margin. Don't do that, it's bad. So, expenditure to revenue. Here's a couple of the mindset things. One, you've got to spend money. That's, money is a problem, money is problematic. We have been taught as a society not to talk about money, not to talk about bidding and billing uh, there's a lot of cultural baggage around ensuring that the people who have the money get to keep the money. If you've got money, you'll be encouraged to spend it. If you spend it, you'll be encouraged to cut it back. If you're cutting back, you'll be told to think of everything as a cost. But the I in ROI stands for investment. And return it's not return on costs, it's return on investment. If you are not investing 
If you are not spending money on your investments, then you're not going to get a return. So something's got to be spent in order to get something back. So time, trade, time, money, and effort can be sold, can be used to buy time, money, and reward. And I go through this again, I come back to this because this is one of the it's the headspace issue. I've been in this business for a long time and valuing your own work is still a difficult challenge. It's still an urge to underprice to get the contract, but that is basically how you end up with winner's curse, where you have bid successfully bid for a contract that will now cost you money to deliver. You don't want to be in that spot. You want to make certain that you have a price on your work and that that price is fair, it covers your costs, and it's reasonable. All right, there's a whole bunch of stuff on budget allocations. Again, what I want you to do with this is I want you to start thinking about what is the optimal set of information you have to work with to establish your budgets. Sometimes it's just going to be guesswork. You're going to go, okay, I've got this amount of currency. I have a bucket of money. I will keep dipping into the bucket till I run out. I will hopefully top the bucket up with sales, but basically, Sometimes it can be a literal, actual physical bucket where you keep um, change, coins, and currency. Sometimes it's going to be a PayPal account. However it works, you're, done, you're doing a commerce degree. You've got some basic accounting up your sleeve. You might know a couple of mates in accounting. Get their help. Trade your time getting their personal brand up for their time getting your budget sorted. So let's talk revenue. There are four revenue streams, and they're labeled zero to three because revenue zero is just that. Revenue zero is a cost. Revenue one gets you some money back. Revenue two is mostly about things that aren't the money, but money is a secondary. And revenue three is we are doing this for the dollars. We're doing this for the cash. All four are a conscious, deliberate strategy and the strategy you need to make. So revenue zero. This is the idea that everything you're doing with the internet under this banner is not intended to make money. This can be a government campaign. This can be a, an advertising campaign, an awareness raising campaign. It really shouldn't be a sales campaign, but it, okay, it's bad if it is, but Basically, behavior, entertainment, promotion, information. You are not here to return money, you're here to achieve an outcome and you're spending money to get there. This is a cost. So this is the first thing. Revenue zero is going to have to be funded by something else. If you don't have the money, you can't afford to do this. Now, If you're going to do that, there's a whole each of the revenues has a funding source. The book goes into a bit more detail. But these are concepts like freemium. Free, freemium, premium. Free is a cost. Freemium basically is a cost, but it's slightly sponsored. Premium is fully sponsored. Premium comes down later. But here it's things like your cross-funding. You run, have a day job, and you do this as a hobby in the evenings you are cross-funding it with your full-time job. The transition point is where you cross-fund it with your part-time job because you're making enough from your third party, from your revenue. Uh, it's revenue zero, but you are still the objective. You're getting revenue from somewhere else. There is a core that is an expense, but you are still able to pull in revenue and start covering some of these costs. Revenue one is where you're not sure about the returns. You'd like that, you think it can be, but you've got some uncertainty around it and you basically have, you know, you're almost operating on charity rather than investment. And it comes with a set of assumptions and these assumptions are the people who are putting the money into the project don't necessarily want to see that money again. Warm, fuzzy feelings are good. 
And this is why venture capital donations and charity are pretty much your sources here. It's uncertain, it's unsure, but it pays the rent or keeps the light on or covers the server costs. So this is where you've got the donate button up for a PayPal donate button on the side of a webcomic. You're trying to cover your costs with funding. You're trying to commercialize, but you still are going to need a third party source of income. Revenue 2, this is where you're starting to look for the money. This is where you are expecting a return, but it's not the direct money goes in, money comes out. So you're looking at this from the point of view of you are using your e-commerce presence. So if we take a Revenue 2 plan for Instagram, you have a physical coffee shop. The coffee shop has a turnover. You are using Instagram to create loyalty and to acquire new customers. You're not making money. Instagram isn't paying you a check at the end of each month. But success in that field of the coffee become the coffee shop becoming well known, a strong brand, loyal brand, whatever it works can be linked back to okay we're selling more coffee, therefore we're making more money as a result of the social media activity. These are harder, but these also bring in a bunch of other concepts. And these are things like product placement. These are things like sponsorship, that you are able to go and barter your access to your audience in exchange for cash, goods, or some other support. So this is, again, with revenue two, you are, covering costs and you're trying to cover more than just your costs and you're looking for creative ways to get that money in. Revenue three is the money. This is open the wallet, break out the credit card, click the button that says buy now, hit the button that says pay through PayPal, however you want to talk about it. The game is simply this, profit. Cover your costs, make back more than you put into the process. Every objective can make a financial return. Every one of those objectives, packet mix objectives you see in that book has the capacity for profit and direct return. So basically what you think about now is how do I make the money? And this is where we look at things like service. Selling services online, not through necessarily Fiverr, but through consultancies, through public speaking fees, selling physical objects. And for those of you who decided to make something, print on demand services, 3D printing, Shapeways, Sazzle, there are a range of product brokers out there. This is where you put a book up for sale on Amazon, you write a digital PDF, you put that up for sale, you get paid money when people buy your product. So this is what your money spinners are. Your money spinners are direct. They are all about coming to someone buying from you. You also have little things where being a marketer comes in handy. We start thinking about merchandising. People walk around the place wearing brands on their clothing that aren't clothing companies. You can sell Harley Davidson coffee cups. Nothing says I'm a rugged biker who lives life on the extreme than a little thimble-sized shot glass with a Harley Davidson logo on it, particularly if it's sparkly pink and can double as an egg cup. This is the merchandising. This is where thinking beyond just what's my core product, what's my actual product I'm selling to people, and what are the spin-offs? What are the products I can offer to my existing audience? Spinners. Money spinners number two, brokerage. If you are in the position to be able to on-sell, being the distribution channel, being the shopkeeper, affiliates, commissions, if you are reviewing products and you are able to get an affiliation so that every time someone clicks through from your review and buys, you take a slice of the sale. Sponsorships, commercial arrangements, commercial trade-off. We've seen a lot of those in Australia in the Instagram field where Tourism Australia goes, we will pay for you to fly 
to a destination, stay there for a week and blog the hell out of it. Here's the hashtag. Here's the declaration it's sponsored. Here's a bunch of money. And because this person is now providing a bunch of interesting content, here's your audience. Lastly, selling of advertising. Look, this is the one that hasn't been done very well. And we're talking here about 20 year history. Advertising on the internet is poorly done because it's not done with the same audience segmentation. If you know who your audience is, and this is why I hammer you about audience segmentation, you can sell ads if you know what products these people want to buy. But if you don't know who they are and you don't know enough about them to know what they'd be into, then your advertising is going to be rubbish. And one of the biggest problems we've got with advertising as a way of paying for people at the moment is we're using a completely rubbish protocol of using the cookies from other websites to trigger adverts. So if you've recently bought a pair of shoes from a company, you are exceedingly likely to see that company advertised all over the place. And it's too damn late. Instead of going, okay, cookie drop, person's bought shoes from us, average time to next purchase of shoes, six months, say, seasonal purchasing. Trigger the cookie, leave the instruction on from your site to drop a small note on that person's computer to, in six months time, trigger ads for a repurchase. Don't trigger ads in the immediate week afterwards. You buy from somewhere and all you see for the next week are ads from the same company you've already bought from. That's useless. It's not reducing cognitive dissonance, it's increasing annoyance. Because you're also seeing the ad for the product you wanted whilst you're waiting for the damn thing to ship to you. So smart advertising is something we haven't done. We're not good at it. It's a big yawning chasm. It's somewhere where we can get, as marketers, get it right, get rich, and stay rich. So last thing I want to bring up in this chapter, in there is a four-part model inside that chapter that is based on social marketing. It's based from an old Kotler and Roberto 1989. It's one of the most robust, kind of brutal in its simplicity, approaches to getting from I have an idea to implementation. But a key one I want to discuss here is the idea of defending the fit. Market fit is really important. And defending that market fit, telling customers, no, you're not our customer, or no, what you want from this product we're not prepared to provide is difficult. There is always an urge to try and back down to make certain you to ignore your segments in favor of, from the stakeholder marketing theory, finding the one with the greatest urgency, not the one with the greatest legitimacy. So what you want to have here is you want metrics. You want to be able to defend. As a marketer, you are not the sole arbiter of decisions on a regular basis, and you will need to justify your actions, sometimes internally to company stakeholders, sometimes externally. You create a product, product court, there's a firestorm of controversy around the product, and you're standing there going, yeah, and? And defending your audience and defending your market, and making it clear that you will go into bat for your audience for their access to this product, and hell or high water, consequences be damned, you are backing that audience, you will get that audience's loyalty. That audience will see you going, okay, you, it's on the line, they're backing us. The thing is, you need to accept your consequence though. Whenever you make a decision, decisions have consequences. Accepting your consequence as something that you desired and living with your consequence is a key part of doing the defense of the fit. You need to know the impact. You need to know that you have 
met the objectives are measurable and you've measured them, that your metrics and that you don't bury the research. If the research says it went wrong, you don't bury the research. You bring that up and say it went wrong, we need to fix. So the metrics plan comes down to a set of really simple questions. How will you know if you've achieved your objective? How are you going to measure that? How are you going so what instruments are you going to use and how will you use those instruments? Oh, I'll measure it with a survey. Who, what, where, what questions, when, how soon after purchase. Detail, detail, detail. What market research will you do for your site? That's both ongoing satisfaction and new market satisfaction. And what scanning monitoring are you going to use? So the last thing here is being effective. And that basically is know who you serve, know who your market is, and serve that market. Accept your consequences of serving that market. And your consequences could be ginormous profit. It could be really angry counter customers. It could be both. But accept these are the decisions I've made and these are the consequences I will live with. Because the killer of an online operation is when it goes, I'm going to address audience A, audience B gets very angry, they, are, they don't like you. If you back down on audience A because they hate audi audience B hates audience A, you lose audience A, but audience B isn't just gonna go, well, now I'll buy your product. No, they wanted to hurt audience A. They didn't wanna buy your product. But at the same time, if an audience comes to you and says, look, I'd really like to buy your product, but you're putting barriers in front of me, listen to them. So it's not about being pig-headed. It's about making a decision and having a consequence. And if you listen to audience A and audience B, and audience A says, well, actually, we're very shouty, but we're very small and financially not terribly viable. And audience B says, well, we're not really that shouty, but we'd love to buy your product, except it's, you know, almost been blocked to us, will you sell it to us? Measure audience B and see if they're worth more money than audience A. If they are, kick audience A out and sell to audience B. But remember, marketing is about creating something of value to the consumer within the constraints of the organization. So if your organization is up for it, do it. If not, leave the market. All right, and that wraps up one of the longer chapters for the sequence. This whole thing, implementation, really useful if you need to, for when you need to document what's happened and how it's happened and get those details down on a page so people know what you did and why you did it and what the outcome was.